Once again, uh, welcome to the Armenian Studies Program Lecture Series. Uh, this is the third lecture in our Spring Lecture Series. We're very thankful to the Leon S. Peters Foundation, which has been sponsoring our lecture series for the past two and a half years. So I would like to thank them for their financial support. And tonight we have the special pleasure of having with us Matthew Karanian, who's going to present uh, his new book, which was just published about a week and a half ago, not even that, just two days ago. Two days ago, there you go. And um, we're the second stop. He's been in Los Angeles, but Fresno has been the second stop for this book. So we're very happy that he's going to uh, present his book. 100 years after the Armenian Genocide, the homeland of the Armenians remains somewhat unknown to much of the rest of the world. And during the century since the genocide, most of the cultural monuments of Armenia uh, in the lands of historic Armenia have been eliminated or repurposed. We'll see that in a little bit. It's appropriate that this book, Historic Armenia After 100 Years, describes the culture and history of the Armenian people and of the Armenian monuments and artifacts that are still existent in places like Ani and Kars and Van and Erzurum and Kharpert and Bitlis, Diyarbekir, Sepastia. But I know that many of you are from smaller towns such as Sasun, Gurun, uh, Chankush, Palu, Zara, Mush, Erzinjan, and Egin. And these will all be presented in the course of uh, Matthew Karanian's lecture. Matthew has been uh, a guest of the Armenian Studies Program on many occasions uh, previously. We're always happy to have him here. He's a second generation Armenian American who currently lives in Pasadena. All four of his grandparents are from Western historic Armenia, and both of his grandmothers survived the deportation during the summer of 1915. He has served as Associate Dean of the Law School at uh, American University of Armenia and as Director of the University's Legal Research Department. He is the author also of Armenia and Karabakh, the Stone Garden Travel Guide, and currently practices uh, law in Pasadena. His book will be available uh, after our lecture, for those of you that would like to purchase it, and I think it's, uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful book to have. Uh, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our guest, Matthew Karanian. Matthew? Well, th thanks very much for, for everyone coming out. I'm really, really excited to be here again. I love traveling to Fresno. This is like a home away from home for me, and it has been for about 10 years now, ever since Barlow started inviting me to make the trek up from Los Angeles. Uh, this book that I'm going to talk about tonight, Historic Armenia After 100 Years, um, I, I'd like to be able to say that I've been working on this book for 18 years and that I had a vision of publishing this book two days ago, just in time for the 100th anniversary. But that wouldn't be true. The book that so many of you have in your hands tonight is in many ways an accidental publication. It was not something that I ever really set out to create. In fact, Traveling to Western Armenia is something that I was very ambivalent about at best when I first went there. What happened was um, I, was working in, I was working in Armenia. I was working in Yerevan. I was a professor at the university. And two of my friends, Armenian-American friends, decided they were going to get married in Gilead, in Cilicia. And they invited me. And I might have turned the invitation down, but for the fact that the bride asked me to be her gunkahide, her godfather, <laughs> so I, I had to go. I had to put my personal feelings aside and I had to travel to Western Armenia, actually farther west than Western Armenia. It's just for the video, so skip this. And so I get on a Armenian Airlines plane from Yerevan and I travel to Istanbul and then to Adana, which is a short distance from where the wedding was. And that's really when the research or the project for this book started. Because remember, I was a professor at the time. And when you're a professor, Barla probably knows this, when you're a professor, you don't, you don't travel for tourism. When you're a professor, you always travel for a project. So this was a project I was working on. It began as a project. And just to give you a perspective on how many years ago this was. I, I was shooting black and white film with a mechanical camera. This is a picture I took. This, these are, this is a frame, a strip of, of images that I took back in 1997. And from that strip, 
I had found one image, one frame that I like, like enough to have used in two books, both of the books that I've brought with me tonight. And what I like about this image is that it shows two things. I, I was standing in the Adadat Valley in the Republic of Armenia. The horse, the horsemen, the cattle, those are all in Armenia, the Republic of Armenia. But the mountain, of course, is on the other side of the frontier. And you know, it's funny, I used to always tell people, I'd give all these presentations on, on the, for the travel guide book, and I would always say, oh, you gotta photograph Mount Adadat, you gotta photograph Masis, and you have to do it with Chorvidab in the front, that's the classic, iconic image. And so I would tell people to go there, and I took a, a group there last year, and I said, this is where we've gotta photograph the, the mountain. And I would always say, the mountain looks so much better on the Armenian side. <laughs> as like a consolation, that it looks better on our side. But I, I really don't feel right saying that anymore because I've traveled to the other side and I know that the other side is not as beautiful as on the Republic of Armenia side. But the fact is both sides are the Armenia side. So it's not really accurate to say that the Armenia side looks better because they're both the Armenia side. But that flight, let me tell you about this flight. I, I was starting to tell you that I took a flight from Yerevan to Istanbul. And this was in 1997. So this is an Armenian Airlines flight. And this was my very first voyage into Western Armenia. And what was kind of neat about that flight was apparently Turkey and Armenia had a, an aviation agreement so that once a week an Armenian Airlines flight could depart from Yerevan and go to Istanbul but it had to be at a certain altitude when it, flied, when it flew over Turkish airspace. So that was great for me because here we are, we take off at Zvartnats in Yerevan, and in order to get to the right altitude before crossing over Turkey, which is just a few miles away, we had to kind of corkscrew up to the right altitude and then shoot across. So we go once around, twice around, three times around, and I'm like, hey, there's the mountain right there, I better get out of my seat and photograph it. So that's what I did, I took off the, the buckle my seat belt, and I walked over to the aisle to, to take the picture where there was an empty seat. And the stewardess was like, oh, Gochinch, you know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but here's, this, here's the mountain from the other side. See, it's not, it's not as beautiful on the other side, but this is also the Armenian side. This is the Western Armenian side. Western Armenian, there's that word again. You know, I, it, it's so hard when you write a book about Armenia, what do you call it? I, I want to call the book Armenia, but that would be totally confusing because there's so many Armenians. We have a Western Armenia, an Eastern Armenia. I finally settled on historic Armenia for this book, which is not really a great title, um, but it was the best and most accurate title because the book covers the six provinces of the six Armenian provinces of what was the Ottoman Empire, and it also covers Ani and Kars which are very much Eastern Armenia and which were part of the first Republic of Armenia in 1918. So it covers both sides, Western and Eastern, hence um, what better name than, than Historic Armenia. So I started my journey in Van. Actually, I started at that wedding that I told you about. And what happened was, it was a kind of a, a, a quick wedding, it was a very short wedding. It lasted only about five uh, days. Uh, and, and after it was all over, the, the bride and groom went on their honeymoon, and, and the other people in the wedding party and the guests, they were going to places like the Mediterranean coast, they were going to lounge on the beach, and I had a flight back to, to Yedevan in a couple of days, and I thought, well, I'm not going to go to the beach with them. That's just ridiculous to go to the beach. So I said, I'm going to go to Van. I was already in Adana. I flew back to Istanbul. Nobody would come with me. Nobody was stupid enough to come with me because this was 1997 and the PKK was very active. In fact, the morning of my flight, a helicopter had been shot down over Vaughan. So I go to the travel agent because back in 1997, you couldn't buy a ticket online. So I went to a travel agent to buy my ticket from Istanbul to Vaughan. And she's like, no, you really don't want to go to Vaughan. And I said, yeah, I'm going. So I persuaded her that I definitely wanted to go, that I was sane, I didn't have a death wish. And she says, fine two conditions. She said, first of all, you do not travel outside. Do not leave your hotel and go outside after dark. Okay, I'm fine with that. The second piece of advice she gave me was, under no circumstances 
should you go anywhere or walk anywhere by yourself? And I said, okay, fine. <laughs> Even though I'm going by myself, obviously I was going to be by myself. So I get to Vaughn, and by the way, let me show you this map really quickly. Um, sometimes audiences will say, you know, what was your favorite church when you were traveling around Armenia? It's a kind of a variation on that question you get when you're five years old, when everybody wants to know what your favorite color is. So if, if anybody here is thinking about asking, what is my favorite map, this is it right here. My favorite map. And the reason it is my favorite map is because my name is on this map. Uh, the man who made this map is Marduros Kheranyan. That was my name before somebody at Ellis Island decided that Karanian sounded better than Kheranyan. So this is a map that was made by my great uncle. Who, um, who lived in Vaughan until 1918. And turns out a major branch of my family was from Vaughan and participated in the defense of Vaughan uh, up until 1918. So I started in Vaughan for that reason. That was the reason I had to go to Vaughan. I had to see where my grandfather and my uncles were from. And of course I didn't find too much. This is the old town of Vaughan, which is completely in ruins except for a couple of rebuilt mosques. And if you look at the, the, the ground, you can see how it kind of undulates. There's, a, there's hills and gullies. That's not natural. The reason the terrain is like that is because after 1918, after the city was, or the town was destroyed, the people who remained came in and started digging everything up. They dug up all the foundations because there's gold, right? There's gold everywhere. So they t dug up the whole place. And now when you walk, you're gonna be walking up and down. Every mountain, every mound you see uh, on this field is a mound that was created by somebody sometime after 1918. So I was told, don't walk alone, ever. Don't go out at night, don't walk alone. So there wasn't too much else to do. I thought, well, I'll go to Akhtamar. That's a safe place. So I take the minibus, the dolmush, they call it, because you're all stuffed together in the minivan. I take the dolmus to Akhtamar, and I take the boat from the dock onto the island. I'm the only American on the boat. In fact, I'm the only person who's not Kurdish on the boat. And I get out to Akhtamar. And I sit down in the cathedral. And I'm just meditating. I'm thinking about Krimian Heidig. I'm thinking about uh, my, my uncles. I'm thinking about my family. I'm thinking about all kinds of things. And I don't know how long I'm sitting there. Maybe I'm, you know, I don't know, five minutes, five hours. I lost all track of time, but at one point, I heard somebody walk in, which is startling because this place was a ghost town. There was nobody there but me. So I hear somebody walk in, and I look up, and I look to the door. Mesrop Ashjan, the Archbishop of the Armenian Church, walks in. He's wearing casual clothes, jeans and a sweatshirt. Behind him, James Russell, armenologist from Harvard University. Behind him, Armin Arroyan from Los Angeles, who probably everybody knows by now because in the ensuing 18 years, he's taken hundreds of people on pilgrimages to Western Armenia. So, so Serpazan is just wearing casual street clothes, but he's carrying a bag. And he opens up the bag, and he's got his vestments in there. So once he comes into the church, he puts on his vestments. He puts on his robe. He takes the Armenian cross, puts it over his head. And just as he transformed himself from a lay person into the serpazan, from, his, from his, his dress, he also transformed the whole experience in all of Akhtamar. We started to sing the Hyde Med. He led us in prayer. And, and this was truly a transformative experience because this was my first day in Western Armenia. My first trip to Akhtamar. I'm by myself. I'm feeling kind of lonely and kind of a little bit not depressed, but sad. And Serpazan walks in. And this, this really set the tone for the next two decades, because I've gone back and back and back. Someone, um, s someone, someone told me at one point, they said, you know, Akhtamar is like the tip of the iceberg. You know, if, if, if Armenia, if Western Armenia is an iceberg, then Akhtamar is the tip of the iceberg that you can see. And the rest of Western Armenia is all below the surface. And I thought, well, that's an interesting metaphor, but I don't, I don't really like that metaphor. And I didn't like it because it was such a clean and, and pure metaphor. And I thought, you know, I, I, I thought, 
about Peter Balakian. You, you've, you've probably read something by Peter Balakian. And I bumped into him at, at Ani last year. Okay, I'm, I'm walking around Ani, and he's there. And we were talking, and uh, he was telling me about Derzor, and he's describing the experience at this final destination of the death marches. And he said he'd see bones sometimes sticking up out of the sand. And he, if he scratched the surface of the sand a little bit, there'd be more bones. And, and, and I thought about what he said, and I thought, that's Akhtamar. Akhtamar is the bone that's sticking up above the sand. And I thought, if I just scratched the surface a little more in my travels around Western Armenia, maybe I can find the rest of, of our lost homeland. So I've been back to Akhtamar many times, and I was there just two years ago. And in 2013, we had a Badarak performed openly. Openly and notoriously performed a Badarak. What a change. 16 years earlier, Serpazan was secretly and furtively singing the Hyde Med, taking off his vestments afterward and hiding them in his bag. And here we are in 2013, we have a Badarak that we perform. And not only was there a Badarak, but when I was there in 2013, we also baptized, we, we Armenians, the Armenian church baptized four people into the Armenian church. And, you know, I thought about that, and I'm thinking yeah, how great it is that we can do this again. But I'm also rather upset about this. And it's interesting, you can be happy and upset at the same time. Um, I'm happy that we're able to have the Badarak once a year now at Akhtamar, <laughs> thanks to the people who have custody of the church. They allow us to do this. But I'm also furious that we have to be allowed to have a Badarak in our own church. We can talk about that more another time. But here's the baptism scene. And here you can see, if you look, the man in the black uh, hood, that's the acting patriarch of Istanbul, and he is administering the rites of baptism to, you can see, two young women in the front. One of them has some flowers on her head. And if you look at the man with the open collar, he, he was baptized also. And just to the right of him, there's a little boy. You see the little boy? That, that boy, his name is Van. And he came from Yerevan with his father to be baptized here on this day. But there's a lot more to see in Van than just Akhtamar. Here's Surptovmas. Um, if we had all day for the lecture, I could tell you how I almost died hiking to this mountaintop <laughs> monastery. I'll save that for another, another visit. There was a serpent inside as well, maybe a snake. I like to call it a serpent because it was so loud. You know, everywhere I traveled in Western Armenia, I was apprehensive. What kind of, what kind of a reception are we going to get? Are people going to jump us? Are they going to mug us? Here at Serp Echmiadzin, which is in the Van region, and just about everywhere else I went, people were happy to see us. They were welcoming us back. The people in the eastern provinces, what is now, what is, what, what is Western Armenia, what is now Eastern Turkey, the people who live there are mostly Kurdish. They're mostly hostile to the Turkish government. And they are mostly receptive to Armenians who return. And when I went to Surp Echmiadzin uh, in the Van region, the place was empty when we first arrived. Then a couple kids started trickling out. We're there for five minutes. The churchyard was full of villagers, all happy to see us, all wondering why we're here and wondering when we'll come back again. Of course, some sites are more remote. This is Garmravank, which stands today in defiance of the vandalism that was imposed upon it by the Turkish government. That's not natural wear and tear that you see on the dome of the church. That's from cannon fire. One of the most st stunning observations that I made in Western Armenia is the difference between what was and what is. I knew what was because of my research and because of photographers such as Vartan Hampikyan, who took pictures such as this in 1914. So I knew what Varagavank looked like in 1914. But when I went 
in 2014, I wasn't prepared for the shock of what it looked like today. You look at this picture, and you can see the three arches of Vadagavank. Vadagavank was a very, very important monastery located just outside of Van. It is a place where Khremian uh, Heidig, for example, um, uh, had a printing press and played a very, very prominent role. And here's what's left of it today. This is not all natural wear and tear. This is a thousand-year-old monastery that was in perfectly good shape until 100 years ago. But on April 30th, 1915, the Turkish military bombed it. What I did find is that some of the more remote locations fare better. If you're on an island, you have a much better chance of surviving because there are fewer people who are going to come out and chip away at you. So this is Gatutz. Gatutz Monastery is so named because it's on an island that's shaped like the beak of a bird, which is, the, which is what Gatutz means in Armenian. And, and this was... Um, this was a picture that I made, I have to say, at great personal risk. I had been there in October one year, and the place was parched, it was dry. And I thought, well, how much more beautiful would this place be in the spring? Everything's more, more beautiful in the spring when it's colorful. So we went back the following year in May. What I didn't realize was that in May is when the birds nest, the gulls nest. And everywhere we walked, there were these little chicks in nests on the, on the ground. So we had to be very careful not to step on them and, and crush them. But while we were watching not to step on the birds, the, the chicks on the ground, we had, to, we had to duck from the gulls overhead that were swooping down, literally swooping down on our heads and attacking us, banging our heads. And, and even worse, um, they, they, were, they were pooping on us. They would <laughs> poop on us to keep us away from their, their chicks. So I took great personal risk to take this photograph. This is Sir Bartholomew. I, you know, we don't have time for me to explain every church, but this is right on the border between Iran and Turkey. It was in a closed military zone up until two years ago. When I first went there, there was still barbed wire around it. We had to lift the barbed wire to cl and climb through. Uh, so it's a very, very new site for, for visitors and for pilgrims. Ani is probably the place that most people want to go to first. That is uh, probably, Ani has more historic sites, more monuments in one square mile than probably any other place in Armenia. If anybody can come up with a, a, another location that has a greater density of, of cultural sites, please let me know. But this is an overview of Ani. Ani is in eastern Armenia, but it is located in today's Turkey. It is just over the border. It was part of Armenia in 1918. It was conquered by Turkey in 1920. It was a military zone that was closed, partly closed, completely prohibited to, to take photographs up until about two years ago. Now you can walk almost anywhere in Ani. Those hills you see behind the, the Monastery of the Virgins, those hills are in the Republic of Armenia. The Monastery of the Virgins, the building that you see in the foreground, that's located in today's Turkey. This was in a military zone until two years ago. Uh, I was really thrilled, I have to say, to be able to hike down to this site last year and see it. One of the first people to hike down, it, to, to hike down the, the hill to this site uh, in quite a few years. You probably all know the Cathedral of Ani. It's one of the most iconic sites of Ani. You see all those rocks? That used to be Ani. What's left of Ani today are the most well-constructed buildings, the churches, the cathedrals. The homes are all gone. The less well-constructed churches and chapels are gone. So as you're walking through the field, all those stones you see, those aren't natural. That's, that's the, rem the remnants of our, of our once mighty capital. And I don't know if this is a beautiful shot or a horrible shot. Sometimes I look at it and I, th I think it's, it's a nice looking photograph, but I can't help but think that this is a scar, 
a deep scar that didn't heal. It shows on the left of the screen the Republic of Armenia, and on the right of the screen Ani, which is in custody of Turkey today. That's the Akhurian River separating the two countries. And this is the same scene, different, different year, different season. That peninsula is in today's Turkey. Everything else is the Republic of Armenia. There's a little building, you can see it. It looks like a little building. It's actually a large monastery on the tip of the peninsula. I suspect that it hasn't been destroyed. It's very hard to reach. I hiked for about two hours and made it halfway there and turned back for lack of time. So I suspect it may be in good condition. That'll be for another trip. This is the Ani Cathedral, again, dr dramatic, huge, massive building. And just to give you a, an idea of just how huge this place is, this is a, like a, a five foot eight person standing inside. Ani is actually magnificently sited. It's, it's, it's surrounded on three sides by ravines and rivers. Only on one side is there an open area where, where invaders could possibly cross into Ani. And it's on this last side of the, of the triangle uh, that is, is built up with these double, uh, double barricades, double walls, and at one point a moat as well. There's been some restoration and reconstruction underway at Ani for the past several years. Uh, the current custodians of Ani would like to designate this as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Um, and the restoration work that they're doing there is with that in mind. The restoration is rather controversial. If you talk to Armenian architects, uh, they will tell you that the restoration work is botched, that it is shoddy, that it is, in, in many cases, simply being done for appearance's sake. Now, I'm not an architect, I don't know, but the scaffolding on this, uh, this church, I don't really see the point of it. What's interesting is, is just a couple of years ago, Ani was off limits. It was a military zone. And when I was there last year, there were people from Hayastan, Hayastansis, with the tricolor. And nobody cared. It's a mosque in Kars. Looks like an Armenian cathedral to me, but it's, apparently it's a mosque. Used to be a Russian Orthodox church as well, and a warehouse, and a munitions depot. Now this is, this is the Cathedral of Meren, which is right on the Armenia-Turkey border. If you, if you were to cross the border from Meren in Turkey over into Armenia, you'd be in Ani Pemza, right, in, right to, the, to the west of Echmiadzin. Meren was a thriving Armenian town. All that's left of it today is this one cathedral, the Cathedral of Meren. Everything you see around it, all the rubble, those are the buildings that have all fallen or been destroyed, been repurposed. And many times what people did was they would take the stones. They've already been hewn, they've already been cut. So they would remove the stones from the Armenian building and they'd carry it off and make a wall or they'd make their own home. And of course, at that point, you've lost all the character of the Armenian building and now you just have quarry material that's being used by someone else. Meren has been in the news recently because Meren, this cathedral you see here, is at risk of collapse. When you walk around many of these churches, you see that the foundations have been dug. The foundations have been excavated, especially at the entrance, especially where the altar used to be. You see deep holes dug. What happens is even now, 100 years after the genocide, 100 years after the Armenians have left, People are still going to these churches, digging deep holes, looking for the gold. And when they don't find the gold, they leave the hole. And the hole weakens the structure. It weakens the foundation, and the church eventually collapses. 
This is a heartbreaking picture. This church, we know it in Armenian as chutzkonk. The Turkish word is besh kilisi. Besh is the Turkish word for five. This picture shows four of the five churches. This picture was made about 100 years ago. The fifth church is off, off the frame. But you can see four of them here. And the Turks continue to call this site Besh Kelesi, as if there were still five churches. What I learned is that sometime between 1955 and 1959, Turks from a nearby military base used chutzkonk for target practice. And they destroyed four of the five churches. Now here we have Horamos, a beautiful monastery just north of Kars, north of Ani. And take a look at the, the bell tower, the very unusually shaped bell tower that you see on the upper right corner of the, of the screen. This is a picture that was made 100 years ago. And you know, a lot of these old pictures that I have from 100 years ago, they're taken, a lot of them are by Vartan Hampikyan. And if anybody here knows who Vartan Hampikyan was, please see me after the presentation, because I'd, I'd like to learn more about who this person was who was able to travel and document so many of our churches 100 years ago. But this is what it looked like 100 years ago, and here it is today. You can see there's the bell tower has survived. Very little else has. This is not decay. This is not natural decay. The picture you saw from 100 years ago was a 1,000-year-old church. The damage that occurred happened in the last 100 years. But you know, I was looking for more than just buildings and, and monuments during my travels throughout Western Armenia. I was also looking for people. And I, I was looking for Armenians, and I found some. In Diyarbakir, I found a woman named Baitzar, and she had lived in Diyarbakir all her life as one of the so-called hidden Armenians. And I met a woman named Asya. Uh, this is in, she was in Chonkush. And we, we, we called her the oldest Armenian of Chonkush. She, she was actually the only Armenian in Chonkush. And she told me her story. I met her last year. She spoke Turkish. I used a translator so I could understand her. And she told me about her mother. Her mother, in 1915, was 10 years old. And one day, they came for the people from her neighborhood in the village of Chonkush. And what they did was over the course of two or three or four days, they came for each neighborhood. And they deported them. They deported them a distance of a few miles to a gorge, to a ravine, where they bayoneted them and pushed them into the ravine. Or sometimes didn't bayonet them, just pushed them in and let them fall to their death. That was the extent of the deportation. Asya's mother was deported to the ravine, age 10. She's standing on the edge of the ravine, and one of the Turkish soldiers sees her. And according to Asya, the Turkish soldier must have thought this 10-year-old girl was very pretty, because he took her for his bride. Five years later, Asya is born. Asya has an Armenian mother who survived the genocide and a Turkish father. A few years later, the Turkish father dies. So they stay in Chonkush. They stay in Chonkush as hidden Armenians. And Asya is brought up by her mother to learn and to know and appreciate that she's an Armenian child and that she should keep her identity a secret. So she lives, she's 95 years old, and she's still there today. She is a descendant of a survivor of the genocide. There were a, a few of us talking with her that day last year. And I asked her, you know, we were, we were talking quite a bit, and she told me her story, and I asked her how she felt when every now and then uh, some Armenian Americans or some Armenians from the diaspora happened to stop by her little village and, and, and connect with her and, and speak to her. And she said, 
I get as happy as a mountain. Some of the hidden Armenians are younger. I met this man in Zada. I was in Zada, which is a town outside of Sepastia, and I asked somebody, again through a translator, I said, where's the Armenian quarter? I really wanted to find the Armenian quarter of Zada, because Zada was where my, my grandmother was from. And he said, oh, there's no Armenian quarter. He says, I, I can't take you to the old Armenian section, but I can take you to an old Armenian man instead. So he called on a cell phone, uh, and he reached this old Armenian man. Turns out the man was too old to come out, but he had two sons. And after a little back and forth, the son finally agreed to come out and meet us, because it's kind of risky. You know, hey, I'm an Armenian American, I want to come meet you. Yeah, right, you know. So he finally comes out, and uh, we talk to him, and he realizes that we're, we're legitimate. And he said, I am the last Armenian of Zada. He said, first of all, I'm 100% convinced I'm 100% I'm Armenian. I know my mother and father were Armenian. And I also know that I'm the last. I said, well, how do you know you're the last? He said, well, there's no Armenian church. There's no Armenian community. I married a Muslim. He didn't say I married a Turk. He said, I married a Muslim. And my two children are Muslim. He said, what am I supposed to do with no Armenian community? So somebody in my group had an Armenian cross and gave it to him, and he put it on, and he wore it. And you can see the cross on his neck. Of course, not everybody in Western Armenia, uh, in historic Armenia, is a hidden Armenian. Haran Dink didn't hide. He lived his life openly. And of course, where did that get him? He was shot dead in 2007 outside his office on the street of Istanbul. But you know, in looking for hidden Armenians, <clears throat> I didn't always accept a person's word. I would look at a person and they'd say, I'm a Turk, I'm a Kurd. And I'd look at them and I wonder. There was a person I met, I was at Akhtamar and I met a woman and I had gone up to her to talk to her because she was wearing a shirt that said USC. I said, oh, maybe she's American. <laughs> she said, uh, no, I'm a Turk. But she had gone to USC to study. So she's, she's a Turk, and I'm thinking to myself, okay, she speaks good English, we're talking, and she's telling me about her background, and I'm thinking she's very open, she's very enlightened to be at Akhtamar uh, on, on the day of the Badalak. And then after talking to her for like 10, 12, 15 minutes, she says, well, my mother, uh, my grandmother was an a Armenian orphan. That's why I decided to come today. A and, okay, you're a quarter Armenian. No, no, I'm a Turk but my grandmother was an Armenian orphan. So I look at a woman like this, and I'm thinking, okay, she's, she's a Kurd, but then is she a Kurd? Maybe she's, uh, maybe she's Armenian. Maybe she's related to me, I don't know. After a while, you start, your mind does crazy things. All right, I wanna show you a couple maps. <coughs> Professor Robert Hewson, who's here, was very, very gracious and allowed me to use several of his maps in the book. Two of his maps show population figures for historic Armenia, before the genocide and after the genocide. Now this is not a scholarly lecture, so I'm not gonna show you a lot of figures, I'm not gonna show you a lot of maps, but I had to show you these two. My favorite one plus these two coming up. This map, the darker the orange, this is the extent of how, how scholarly I get. The darker the orange, the more the Armenians. The darker the orange, the more the Armenians. So look at the dark orange, you can see lots of Armenians, 1914. The darker the orange, the more the Armenians. Erzu, zero. Van, zero. Bitlis, zero. Diyarbakir, 500. Thank you, Professor Hewson, for creating this map. And hidden Armenians, also hidden, hidden Armenia. Look for the Khachkar in somebody's wall. The kids know, by the way. The people there, they know. When you go to the eastern provinces and you talk to the people, they know. They know about the genocide. They know about the Armenians. They know my grandfather was friends with an Armenian. They know everything. Istanbul, they don't know so much. But in the, in the eastern provinces, yes, they know. The children will come running, and they'll show you the Armenian Khachkar. They'll show you where the Armenians used to live.
Now, I've been to all the provinces, all six provinces. It's a little tough looking for finding the Armenia in Erzurum and Sepastia. There isn't too much there. A lot of it's been wiped clean. There's a few places, if you know, if you know where to find them, I list them in my book. They're hard to get to. The Monastery of the Nine Tombs in Erzinjan, which is in western Erzurum. Erzurum's mostly been wiped clean. But there are pockets. There are pockets, and they tend to be in the more remote locations. And they tend to be in the remote locations because that's where people couldn't get at them to destroy them. But if you walk the streets of Sepastia, good luck finding anything Armenian. I went to Zada. Zada is just outside Sepastia. And that was where I met that, the last Armenian man. And Zada was a town that was important to me because that was where another branch of my family was from. That's where my, one of my grandmothers was from. What was so unnerving for me in Zada, and in, in other towns as well, was how friendly the local people were to me. Unnerving. I went to Zada. I knew about Zada. I knew about these places that I went to. I knew what happened 100 years ago. I wanted the people to have horns. I wanted them to be mean and evil. But they're greeting me with smiles, and they're laughing, and they're happy to see me. And that made me very uncomfortable. But these people who I met um, didn't commit the genocide. And, but for the government of Turkey, um, there wouldn't have been a genocide. All right, a bit of levity. Food, right? You got to go. You got to eat. The food in Western Armenia is so much better than the food in the Republic of Armenia. <laughs> if you want to eat good food, you got to go to Van, Zepastia. You got to go. Forget about Yedavan. Uh, I went to some remote places. Gurun. Anybody here from Gurun? This is the center of Gurun. It, it's still there. The church is still there. Um, they're renovating the Armenian Quarter. They've actually taken some Armenian homes, this main street in Gurun in the Armenian Quarter, and they're rebuilding them. They're doing the same thing in Malacha. There, there, there actually is, is a push to save and conserve. They don't do it in the name of Armenia. They do it in the name of, I don't know, ancient Anatolian history. But still, they're preserving it. And, and if you're from Gurun, you can go on the street and you can see where perhaps somebody from your family lived 100 years ago. Anyone here from Kharper? Yeah, you know, the, the U.S. government um, had a census or, or, or survey, and this is back in 1915, before the genocide. And the U.S. government estimated that if you were an Armenian living in the United States before the genocide, 1914, there was an 80% chance that you were a Kharpetsi. 80% of the Armenians in America before the genocide were Kharpetsi. Why is that? Well, the, uh, the US, uh, there were US missions in Kharpert. There was a US college in Kharpert. There was a strong American presence in Kharpert. And so the Armenians living there would get associated with, and they'd, they'd, they'd learn about America, they'd, they'd learn some English, and they would want to travel to the US. Because of the US missions that were located and the US businesses that were located in Kharpert, that's one of the reasons why the US government established a consulate office in Harper to protect those American interests. And it's because of the consulate, Leslie, the US consul Leslie Davis, who was in the Harper region during the genocide, it's because of him that we have a first person, independent, non-biased account of what happened in 1915, at least in this area. And what US consul Leslie Davis called this area in 1915, he called it the Slaughterhouse Province. This is an American citizen calling it the Slaughterhouse Province. But this is Harper. This is the fortress of Harper. That grassy hill that you see in front of the fortress is what used to be the Armenian Quarter. And I know a lot of you already have my book. Turn to the section on Harper. You'll see this photograph, and, or, or a similar photograph, and you'll also see what it looked like 100 years ago. It's littered with, with, with homes, full of homes. 
This is the gorge I was talking about before. This is where Asya's mother was taken. You see that pit down there in the, the bottom of the screen? That's, it's an almost bottomless pit. Obviously, it's not bottomless, but it, 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 if you drop a penny in, as I did, it's, it's quite a few seconds before you hear the penny clang to the bottom. It's a very deep pit. There's two girls in this picture, two Kurdish girls. I spoke to these girls. Why are you here? Oh, we're just hiking. What do you know about this place? Again, I'm speaking with, a, with an interpreter because they don't speak English. What do you know about this place? Oh, <clears throat> this is the place where the Armenians fell. You know, I'm kind of angry, but I'm also understanding. This is what they're taught. They're not taught that there was a genocide. They're taught, yeah, a lot of Armenians fell into this gorge. That's what they know. So I'm driving, I'm in Erzinjan, we're driving. There's a group of tourists on the side of the road. They're having their picture taken in front of this, this gorge, this river with cliffs on either side. It's a great tourist spot. I ask my driver about it, what's, what's, what's the relevance of this area? He says about 10,000 Armenians were pushed over the cliff in 1915. So you're traveling in Western Armenia and there's all these great sites, these historical places you wanna see, but you cannot escape the genocide. Everywhere you go, you know this was the route. You know, I was traveling, I took a bus from, uh, I took a bus south from uh, Malatya, and I took it all the way uh, restored. They teach Armenian lessons, Armenian language lessons in the church. Here's the interior of the church. One of the largest Armenian churches of the Middle East, might be the largest, I'm still researching that, I'm trying to find one that's larger. In Diyarbakir, you can even find a genocide memorial. They, they don't use the word genocide, but it's a memorial to the people who lost their lives in 1915. Diyarbakir is enlightened. So, you know, I have all these heavy experiences all over Western Armenia, but then I go to Diyarbakir and I'm, I'm, I'm uplifted. I'm thinking maybe there's a chance, maybe there's some hope for the future. You know, one of the, one of the, one of the overarching questions that I've, that I've had over all these years of the research that I've done is were we Armenians wrong to have stayed away from our homeland for the past hundred years? You know, I, I didn't want to go that first time in 1997 for the wedding. I didn't want to go, but I went. And I know why we don't go, and I know why we didn't go for a hundred years. All four of my grandparents are from Western Armenia. I understand. This is not a place you go as a tourist, so I understand why we don't go. But what I've been trying to understand is, have we been wrong not to have gone for the past 100 years? And after, what is it, 15 years more of traveling to Western Armenia, I do not have an answer to that question. I think that's a question everyone has to answer for himself. But I do know this. After all these years, after tracking the ongoing destruction, I do know that if we stay away for another 100 years, there won't be anything left for us to see in 2150. I, um, I just want to close with a couple of pictures of some important people. These are my two grandmothers. I dedicated the book to these two women because these women are two of many women who helped to rebuild our nation after 1915. Both of these women survived the genocide. They were actually deported. The woman on the left, that's my mom's mother. She died before I was born. I never met her but I know everything about her. My mother told me. She was from Zada. She had a husband and five kids in Zada, a town just outside of Sepastia. One day in the summer of, 20, of, of 1915, her husband was stoned to death in front of her and her five children. She's grief-stricken, the, the kids are just panic-stricken, and they get deported. 
them and everybody else in her town. They get deported. Without much delay, one of her children, Hagop, is kidnapped by a Kurdish family. Now she's down to four kids. I guess you could say that my grandmother was a murderer because she took her infant and left it under a tree. Now she's down to three kids. One of those kids is named Aznif. She starves to death. The other one starves to death. She marches from Zara all the way to Adana, 500 kilometers. It took her about three years. She got there with her oldest son, 14-year-old boy named Yavashe. He was the only one who was strong enough to survive. She lost four kids. She makes her way to first Massachusetts and then Rhode Island, and she gets remarried. And she has two kids. The first kid is a girl. What does she name it? Osnif. Another girl named Osnif. The second child, same name. Osnif is my mom. This is what I know about her from my mother. The other grandmother, the woman on the right, I knew her all my life. She passed away, I don't know, 15 years ago. I know nothing, nothing about what happened to her. Grandma, tell me what happened. She'd cry. If I know so much about what happened to my mom's mom on the left, and it was horrible, I just can't imagine how much worse it must have been for the other surviving grandmother who couldn't, couldn't articulate what happened. So I dedicate the book to them and to everybody's grandmother and to everybody who survived and everybody who rebuilt, who came back to this country and said, okay, we've been wiped out, our homeland's wiped out, but we're gonna start again, we're gonna have more kids and we're gonna rebuild our Armenian nation. And here we are 100 years later and we're sitting in a room and we're celebrating the fact that we're still here today and we will still be here 100 years from today. I want to thank you for sharing this, this evening with me tonight. And um, I'll be happy to take any questions that anybody has if, if, if you have any.